Toward the end of last year, I reviewed the Supermicro 620p mainstream server that you see on my desk here. In that review, I said it could be the ultimate all-in-one solution for small and medium businesses. Today, I'm going to explain what I meant by that by setting this up as I would a traditional small business server and showing you what you can fit inside of a 2U package. If you've ever thought about running your own servers for home or business use, but don't want to deal with the headaches of maintaining hardware, why not let Linode host your services for you? They make it simple to deploy and manage your own cloud infrastructure, with solutions ranging from a single shared CPU to massive multi-core virtual machines. You can even add in dedicated enterprise GPUs for machine learning. With shared CPU plans starting at as little as $5 per month and scaling up to as high as you need to go, you'll be able to find a hosting plan that fits your needs. They also have 24-7, 365 support available, regardless of your plan size. That's a better support plan than I have on my personal server rack, I can tell you that much. Visit linode.com slash craft computing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. That's linode.com slash craft computing. And thanks to Linode for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Some of you may not know this about me, but I spent 13 years in enterprise IT, and a good chunk of that was done in small and medium-sized operations, supporting servers and deploying new offices with systems just like this. In fact, general purpose servers like this were pretty much my bread and butter. As a quick refresher, this is the Supermicro 620p mainstream server. Inside, it has a pair of Intel Xeon Gold 6330 third-gen scalable processors, each with 28 cores and 56 threads. That means there's a total of 56 cores and 112 threads, with a base clock of 2 GHz and an all-core turbo of 2.8. Backing up all of that CPU horsepower is 512 GB of DDR4 ECC registered 3200 MTS memory spread across 16 memory channels. This particular server supports up to 4 terabytes of DDR4 ECC registered memory or up to 4 terabytes of Intel Optane persistent memory modules. With 8 3.5 inch SATA drive bays up front, in theory you could support up to 160 terabytes of raw storage using today's higher capacity drives. The server also has dual 10 gigabit network ports thanks to an Intel X550 controller on board. Package all of that up with an IPMI LiTAD interface, redundant 1000 watt power supplies, and a depth of just 25 and a half inches, it's a pretty compelling server that can fit just about anywhere. You all know I am a huge proponent of free and open source operating systems. Just look at the back catalog of TrueNAS and Proxmox videos here on the channel. However, when it comes to small business deployments, I actually lean more towards Windows. A lot of the companies that I worked with had very limited IT resources, which is why they called me in the first place. So in most cases, I would deploy Windows just so any tech that happens to follow in my footsteps might have a fighting chance at figuring out what's going on. It's important to remember when working with small and medium businesses, even if you have a favorite tool or product, that doesn't necessarily make it the best tool or product for every single situation. Listen to your clients' needs and figure out what their ongoing support solutions will be and if you are going to be part of it. Now that I've gotten rid of all the Linux fanboys, today we're going to be installing Windows Server 2022 Standard Edition and installing Hyper-V as our hypervisor. While every client is going to have different requirements for their particular rollout, I did see a trend when it came to the services that they requested. So in this system, we're going to install those most common services and give you a very surface level tutorial on how to set them up. One of the most common services needed is a firewall, and there are a couple different ways you can do this. You can get dedicated hardware with something like a Unify Security Gateway, or go for a virtualized solution and install PFSense. We're going to do the latter today and keep the hardware costs isolated in the server itself, but either option works just as well. If you need to deploy wireless access points, chances are you're going to need to install a local controller on your client's network as well. Most of the time for me, that's Unify as it's the controller that I know best, and that's what I've installed here today. However, pretty much any controller software that runs on Windows or Linux can be installed in much the same way. For office environments that primarily use Windows PCs, you may want to think about deploying an Active Directory server, especially if you plan on using a file server with tiered user permissions. On the technical support side of things, you may want to keep an eye on network services as well, so services like Observium are definitely a great idea, even if the client didn't specifically request it. 
Last but certainly not least, some organizations will request content filtering on their internet connections. This can keep employees, students, or even patrons off of sites you'd rather they not be visiting on your premises, or as another layer of protection from the seedier places of the internet. Now, a good chunk of these services I've actually done tutorials on before, and you can find all of those down in the video description. A couple of them, like Active Directory, are brand new. And if you're interested in learning more about Active Directory, let me know down in the comments and I'll consider writing up a series. If it wasn't already obvious, today I'm running Windows Server 2022 Standard Edition and Hyper-V for our virtual machine hypervisor. I've got four 12 terabyte NAS disks set up for our storage in a RAID 5 through Windows Disk Management and a single NVMe drive for our operating system. One area where a lot of people get into trouble when trying to deploy an all-in-one solution like this is not thinking about a backup system. Remember, there is only a RAID 5 inside of this box, and you should all know, RAID is not a backup. So make sure you price out a backup solution when you are planning out a rollout for any of your customers. Let's go ahead and start with the primary services on a network first. That would be DHCP, DNS, and user authentication. To handle that, we'll be setting up a Windows Active Directory server inside of a virtual machine. We're going to start off by creating a new Windows virtual machine inside Hyper-V and setting it up as a Generation 2 virtual machine, which means it'll boot with a UEFI BIOS. Services like DNS, DHCP, and Active Directory are not all that hardware intensive and don't need a lot of resources. I am going to set up 12 gigabytes of RAM on this virtual machine, but I'm also going to enable dynamic memory, meaning the Windows guest will only allocate the RAM that it actually needs. You'll also need to connect the virtual network card to a virtual switch inside of Hyper-V, and this can be done in a pull-down menu as part of the wizard. The rest of the wizard is pretty much just clicking next until your virtual machine has been created. Here we are living in 2022 and Microsoft is acting like it's still 2003 because even after going through the VM creation wizard, Microsoft only allocates a single CPU core to each new VM. What that means is you'll still have to open up the settings menu and give it a couple more CPU cores because I don't know of any modern services that can run on just a single thread. With the new VM created, go ahead and install Windows Server 2022 on your Windows Server 2022 Hyper-V server, because I heard you liked Windows Server 2022, yo. After installation, you'll be prompted to create a local admin password and then log in for the first time. Now, the first thing I recommend doing on any Windows Server install is changing the computer name so you don't get confused when you're installing services. In this case, we're going to name this craft active directory-01 and go ahead and reboot the VM. Once you're back on the desktop, we'll want to install all of the services that we need for this particular server. And again, that's going to be DNS, Active Directory, and DHCP. Under your server manager, click on Manage, and then go down to Add Roles and Features. Skip forward to the Add Roles page, and then select Active Directory Domain Services, DHCP, and DNS Servers. On the server, we won't be installing any features, so go ahead and click on Next. The next screens will display a summary of all the services you've selected. And if everything looks good, go ahead and click on Install. Once all the roles have been installed, you'll be prompted to promote the server to a new domain controller. And as this is a standalone server going into a new environment, we're going to set it up as a brand new server in a brand new forest. For that, I'm going to set this up with the domain name of craft.local and run through the rest of the DC Promo Wizard to finish off the steps. At the end of the wizard, you will have a chance to review the promotion script, and I do highly recommend you take a look at that and confirm that all of your settings are correct, because most of them you will not be able to change later on. If everything looks good to you, go ahead and click on Next, and after the script has ran, your server will reboot automatically. For pretty much all Windows servers that I set up, I will pin the services installed to the taskbar. The easiest way to do that is to search for the services you installed, so DHCP, DNS, and Active Directory Users and Groups, right-click on the icon and select Pin to Taskbar. We're going to install DHCP, and it is a very simple process. Click on the DHCP icon down on the taskbar, select your server from the left-hand window, and then click on IPv4. Right-click on the IPv4 service and go down to New Scope. Walk through the steps in the new scope wizard to define the name of this DHCP scope, the IP range that you'll be using, the subnet mask, any exclusions you may have, lease time, default gateway, and more. With the wizard done, it'll ask if you want to activate the new scope. So go ahead and click on yes or no, hit finish, and your DHCP server should now be set up. Complete this step for each DHCP range you'd like to broadcast on your network. 
The other two icons that I had you pinned to the taskbar, Active Directory Users and Computers and Group Policy Management, will be two of your most visited applications on this Windows server. AD Users and Computers is where you create and manage user accounts and add users and computers to various security groups. The Group Policy Manager is where you'll define all of the default settings for objects in an Active Directory group. This can include security and trust, user behavior, setting up network resources, and even changing things all the way down to the most fine-grained settings, like how big desktop icons should be and what desktop background should be in place when a user logs in. And before I piss off all the Windows admins that I have left in the audience, since I already scared away the Linux people, let me just say that I know Active Directory and Group Policy Management is a masterclass unto its own, and I haven't even scratched the surface of installation or configuration in today's video. Nor am I going to. But if you'd like to see a masterclass on Active Directory, let me know down in the comments below, and I'll consider putting some kind of class together. Probably in a series of videos. For the next couple surfaces, it is important to keep in mind that even though we are running Windows Server 2022 and Hyper-V, you're not limited to just Windows Virtual Machines. In fact, for the next two services, I'll be installing Ubuntu Server 20.04. The next service we're going to install is a Unify controller for things like wireless access points and security cameras. The installation process is pretty much cut and paste with instructions directly off the Unify website. The first step is to create a new virtual machine and install Ubuntu 20.04 off of an ISO. There are only a couple prerequisites to getting the Unify controller up and running. First off, like all Ubuntu servers, you'll want to start off with an apt update and an apt upgrade to make sure the server is 100% up to date. Then you'll want to install the packages, CA certificates, apt transport HTTPS, and the OpenJDK 8 Java runtime. With all of that handled, you'll just need to add Unify to your repository list and download Unify's trusted keys. Finally, just install Unify. A controller for a small office won't take very many resources, and I've allocated 8GB of memory to this virtual machine along with 8 CPU threads. If ad blocking and content filtering are high in your priority list, NX Filter is a product I've used a number of times in the past, and in fact I've already done a tutorial for it on my channel. It's a DNS-based solution that integrates very well into Active Directory, allowing you to customize access or log DNS requests on a per-user or per-device level. PFSense is a very popular firewall solution to run, especially in a virtualization environment. Best of all, inside Hyper-V, the only requirement is having at least two available network ports. Getting PFSense up and running inside Hyper-V is extraordinarily simple. First off, just download the ISO installer from the PFSense website and set up a virtual machine as you normally would. Before booting up and installing the PFSense server, head on over to the Hyper-V Manager, right-click on your server, and go down to Virtual Switch Management. Create a new external virtual switch and name it WAN Connection. You'll also want to select the second network card that is not being used in your system. The most important part of this is uncheck the box that says Allow Management Operating System to share this connection and then click on OK. With the switch set up, you'll want to add a second network card to your PFSense VM. Right-click on the VM, go down to Settings, and then click on Add Hardware. Here, we're going to add a new network adapter. In the pull-down menu, connect this network adapter to the WAN connection switch we just created, and then click on OK. And finally, start your virtual machine and install PFSense as you normally would. Once PFSense has been installed, you'll be taken to a first-time setup wizard of sorts, where you'll configure your network cards and which connection is which. Typically, network card 0 is going to be your LAN connection, and network card 1 will be your WAN connection. With PFSense up and running, you'll just want to connect your incoming internet connection to the second network port on your server, and you should be ready to set it all up. With PFSense up and running, you've got pretty much all of the minimum requirements for a small to medium-sized business. We've got a firewall, DHCP, and DNS, along with DNS-based content filtering for those pesky employees, Active Directory for user authentication and network security, a Unify controller for wireless network access, and plenty of expansion options if the business outgrows its current needs. Now, as it sits right now, the Super Micro 620p mainstream is massively overkill for pretty much any small business I would ever work with. No five-person real estate office needs 56 cores and 512 gigabytes of DDR4 registered memory. But for a lot of medium-sized businesses, say upwards of 50 employees, a system like this actually makes a lot of sense. But for smaller offices, you could easily run all of the services that I showed off here today on a much smaller server, say something between 8 and 12 cores with 64 gigs of RAM. 
As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, general purpose servers like this are pretty much the Swiss army knife of small to medium sized businesses. You could run every storage configuration from eight terabytes to 160 terabytes, everything from eight cores to 80 cores, or everything from 64 gigs of RAM to four terabytes of RAM with four terabytes of Intel Optane storage. In this video, I showed you what my standard deployment would look like for a small to medium sized business server, say if there were 15 to 30 users in place. But what services do you deem to be important and what would your rollout look like? Let me know down in the comments below. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And as always, if you're interested in any of the hardware that I showed off in today's video, I will have affiliate links down in the video description. Go give those a look as well. Thanks again to Supermicro for sending out the 620p mainstream server for me to take a look at. I definitely enjoyed having it in my rack for a short time. But first thing Monday morning, it's got to go in a box and head back to them. In the meantime, thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Beer for today is from Treehouse Brewing over in Rhode Island. It is the Double Shot Technicolor Imperial Stout, clocking in at 10.8%. Normally I say it looks like motor oil, I really wonder what weight that is. <laughs> the beer in this bottle was con... This isn't a bottle, this is a can. Clearly says bottle, though. The beer in this bottle was conditioned to top a custom blend of house-roasted coffee that thoroughly accentuates the broad spirit and character of our coffee program here at Treehouse. With flavor notes of dark chocolate, cocoa powder, and syrupy caramel, it combines the best elements of monochrome and house blend. Double Shot Technicolor will pair perfectly with your favorite sweater this fall. Enjoy. I will. Dark and roasty, but with almost this German chocolate cake, raspberry kind of tang towards the front and middle of the flavor. Normally, any fruit being present in a stout means something went wrong and they're just trying to sell it to you. There's no such thing as a sour stout. There's a stout that went bad. In this case, that is just delicious. This is a very interesting beer. Uh, Rhett and I have been going back and forth for a couple minutes trying to suss out all the different flavors that are coming through. It might become a little bit more clear once it warms up, but here's what we've got so far. There is a deep, deep dark chocolate and coffee roast to this. It's it's very, very much like a, a multi-shot mocha that you would get. Uh, and while it's a dark, rich, roasty flavor, there's this playful sweetness up on top of it. Now, they say it's a syrupy caramel, or caramel, uh, but that's not quite right. Like, I, I'm... I'm having a really hard time identifying what that that more playful characteristic of this is. Super complex, uh, and definitely not bad at all. Okay, we better do this, or I'm just gonna review your. <laughs> what is this, hops and brews? No, you came here to learn something. <laughs> now this beer is almost gone, and I have been sitting in front of the camera for right around 90 minutes. Man, I am not getting tired of this beer. That light sweet note has evolved down into kind of that rich syrupiness that they described on the can with the, the caramel, cocoa powder, and dark chocolate. Um, this is much more like a super dark double or triple shot of mocha now instead of the little bit of a lighter kind of counterintuitive stout that it started as. A lot of evolution, very complex, and absolutely a fantastic brew. Pick one up if you can.